Next contributed talk is uh, by Dan Padilla of Q Branch. One thing I've learned is that the X is silent <laughs> in Q Branch. Testing, testing. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Dan. I'm from Q Branch Australia. Um, we're a data analytics and software engineering firm. We do a bit of quantum computing uh, research, both in the universal space and in the adiabatic space. Um, mainly software-related stuff. Um, yeah, we have D-Wave agreements with both Lockheed and, and NASA as well, so we get to play around a lot. Um, some of my colleagues are here, and you might have seen some of their posters before. They've done this stuff here, so Boltzmann sampling for predicting the US election, which is pretty cool, and a hybrid algorithm for convolutional deep belief networks. So if you're interested in either of those and you didn't see the posters, come and talk to us. Um, so this was a, a small project that we got asked to, well, I got asked to do by, from a multinational investment bank. Um, basically, the idea was they just wanted a quick machine learning proof of concept on an adiabatic annealer. Um, they wanted to look at regularization on linear models. Uh, I'll get into what that means. Um, so what I'll do, and, and they wanted to know how, how to actually deploy it into their own system. So what I'll do is I'll talk you through a bit what data analytics and machine learning is it's like, it, what it's about, um, specifically those things. Uh, some tools and practices, things that I, I found useful as a software engineer. I'm not a researcher, so I, I hope you'll forgive my lack of bit. There's not much science in this. <laughs> I apologize. Um, and some, I'll, I'll show you the simple linear implementations that I made and a few results that may or may not be interesting to you. So the basic idea behind uh, data analytics and machine learning is data analytics is just about extracting insights from data sets. Um, making actions based on those insights. Uh, machine learning is kind of, they're, they're very overlapping terms. Machine learning, we kind of say, is just giving a model, like learning a model based on some, di on some data that you get and generating predictions automatically from that. Um, you know, in practice, they're just buzzwords for applied statistical analysis. That's all it is. Um, it's just a bunch of magic that you throw. You throw them, throw data at linear algebra, you tweak it around a bit, um, make sacrifices to the statistic gods, and it all works. So linear regression is a, the model that they wanted me to look at specifically. It's a very simple model. You've probably used it before in Excel or something. You've just got a bunch of points, and you fit a line to it. Super easy. If you've got it in n dimensions, then you've got an n-dimensional surface. Super easy again. It's just a linear thing. If you have a data set which is, consists of rows of samples, of features, and what you're trying to learn is you're trying to learn a, a set of feature weights and maybe an offset that when you multiply them together, you get a set of predictions. So this is a value that you're predicting from these samples. Um, you're also given a set of target values, which is the, the data that you're trying to predict, basically. Um, so you're trying to learn a model. The basic idea behind most machine learning algorithms like this is that you're trying to minimize an error. So your prediction minus the value you've actually seen, you want to make that as small as possible. So feature selection is something that we want to add to some of these models. And what it is is basically when, when you have a model like this, um, you don't want to have it overfitted. So this is an overfitted model here. You have some points, and your model is this blue line. And you can see it matches up with the points really perfectly well, but you've got some weird bits like here where there's no, no points, and that's that's not what you'd expect an actual like prediction to be. You wouldn't want it to be down there. So what you want is a, a good fit for a model. Um, because if you, if you don't have that, then it's less accurate to predict any data that you haven't seen before, so anything that, that's not part of what you learned from. Um, one of the methods to do this sort of feature selection is uh, feature selection by regularization. Basically, you're trying to just minimize the complexity of the model that you're building. If you have uh, features that you're trying to trying to learn, you want to learn maybe as few features as possible, that still gives you an accurate prediction. So basically what you do is you add a, an extra term, regularization term, and this, this notation here is basically called a norm. It just means this is the size of the vector. I know this is probably really obvious to a lot of you guys, but just in case you, you're not aware, um, the norm just means it's the size of the vector, and you pick, you basically pick what kind of uh, size you want to define, like how you want to define the size of the vector. So 
what you're probably aware of is the Euclidean size. If you have a vector, the Euclidean distance of, of that vector is just square root of squareds. Um, but there are also these other norms, L1, L0, there's other kinds as well. Um, what these norms have in, in difference is that they, they are more likely to find uh, models where a feature um, is, so they're more likely to find sparse uh, models where you have less features. So here, if we have feature one and feature two, and the blue line is the set of all possible uh, models that you can build, you wanna find one of these two dots because in this dot, only feature two is present. In this dot, only feature one is present. Everywhere else, fe both features are present. So you wanna find one of the more technically, theoretically optimal points. Um, so L L2 and L1, L2 doesn't really find these optimal sparse ones. L1 does, but it's not quite as good as L0. But the problem with L0 is that it's a, um, it's a, uh, a non-convex problem, so it's very difficult to do computationally. Um, but, you know, this is, we want to try hard things, so this is why we use the D-Wave and quantum annealers. Um, so if you want to build this kind of model, you basically just pick which norms you're going to use, L2 and L0, for your loss and your regularization functions. Um, here, what I, what I did is I learned the weights as an actual, um, this is a, a, a assigned integer value, so it takes a, a value between the range negative alpha to alpha of some constant. Um, and you, you can implement the, if you have this weight as, a, as an integer, you can implement a L0 uh, norm as just, you take the sum of the bits, and if it's greater than zero, then you penalize it with a, a penalty, basically. Um, when you want to actually get to the, the D wave, there's a lot of processes, in, uh, a lot of steps involved. There's this often, this step here that takes a lot of time and, and effort and mental energy just to work out, um, to go from that point to that point. So something that might be helpful to, if you've never encountered this before, is um, symbolic computation. Um, the idea is that if you know your model like this, and you don't know how to get to the icing problem from it, then, well, why don't you just let the computer figure it out for you, right? So you just program, you've got the green bit here, so it's just y dot product of x and w plus b squared. w zero, which is this bit here, is just a sum of all these things with some variable rates. So um, this is just an example of using uh, a tool like SymPy, Symbolic Python. It's just a library, the Symbolic Math Toolbox, I think does the same thing for MATLAB, I've never used it, so I don't know. Um, but the idea is you can set this as like your, your Hamiltonian. You say your Hamiltonian is loss plus your lambda times a regularization. And then, you know, if you've got a D-Wave solver, you can tell the, the symbolic expression to just like get the icing problem for you. Uh, obviously, you have to write that a procedure to do that. But, um, and then you just run it on solver. So it's super easy. Um, so if you haven't encountered this sort of thing before, you might want to check it out. Um, you can get the results back from, if you have your, your W as your variable, you just get the, like the best result, best solution, just brings it out for you. So that makes things super easy. Um, but obviously, it's when you wanna actually deploy this and run it on experiments and that sort of thing, you wanna get your proper uh, algorithm that actually does all the, all the magic, all the bits in the middle. Um, so something that you can use, so I don't know if you've, Probably everyone here has used these, but if you haven't, NumPy is a Python library as well that will let you do computationally efficient linear algebra. So if you've got you know, your steps out, you can just write them in, and they're super easy, and they go super fast. Um, if you haven't heard of X-Array, this is a really cool uh, multidimensional array library that adds um, labels to coordinates. And so if you've used pandas, it's like a multidimensional version of pandas which is a bit of a weird uh, thing to write into Google. Um, and something else that I think is really important is um, if, you, if you haven't come from a software background, you might not know about regression testing and uh, version control. Uh, I hope that everyone here uses version control, but if you don't, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. Um, so things like Git and Mercurial. Mercurial um, Regression testing is basically just trying to protect yourself against changes. So you want to have a, a set of tests that just like make sure that your your program is running as expected, and if you make changes to it, 
Um, it doesn't break, it doesn't cause bugs, and you, you can cache them easily. And the reason I bring this up is because if you're also doing the symbolic computation stuff, you can use it to verify your like procedure against a machine uh, design or machine computed um, symbolic expression, which is really cool. So as an example that I have here is you, you know, I've got my symbolic and my computed like sim, uh, symbolic com computation one, and I just check that they're both the same for it, and then this works every time. Uh, once you've got a once you've got this sort of model for machine learning, that's only one small part of the whole machine learning pipeline. That's this training bit. But machine learning is about about a whole process, and it involves you know getting your data set, getting pre-processing it, getting the features ready, um, actually doing the training and tuning the parameters that you have to send into it, uh, evaluating and doing a kind of cross valuation or cross validation. Sorry. Um, and obviously, at some point, you also have to have a deployable model, something that you can actually like put in a server somewhere, and it'll work, it'll work on any data that it's given. Um, so if you're kind of writing these things your, yourself, uh, you're really reinventing the wheel. There's a lot of libraries that already do a lot of the stuff. Again, this is probably obvious to a lot of you, but if you haven't heard of this, scikit-learn is another Python library that basically does all of this thing. So, and a lot of people use it in the real world. Um, so the thing about it is it's highly extensible and what you can do is you can build your own estimators, right? And they can use the D-Wave and train. So here is an example where I built a, a linear model and it's subclassed from a linear model from scikit-learn. So all I have to do, the only thing I have to do in this whole code is write this one function, fit. It takes my symbolic problem that I wrote before, builds an icing problem out of it, runs it on the, on the D-Wave solver, gets the best solution, decodes the, uh, the two variables that I care about, that's it. And immediately, I can use this as any other uh, estimator. So we've got Elastinet, Lasso Ridge, these are other types of, of models. And I can use them all with the exact same code. I can do cross-validation on them, score them, all this stuff using the same code, you know, ch checking any parameter space that I want. So if you haven't looked into this, um, it's very useful to just like extend existing libraries rather than reinventing your own sort of thing. Um, so what I did is I implemented these two uh, models, a, a linear regression and a linear classifier, threshold classifier, um, and I compare them against a bunch of uh, existing algorithms. Um, especially these nonlinear state-of-the-art ones, random forest and gradient boosting. And what I did is I had a, a bunch of data sets, um, mostly synthetic ones, but also some real data that I, I got given by the bank, um, which had a lot of points in it. Uh, mostly I could only fit 12 features on the D-Wave, so obviously that doesn't help for real-world data, which requires a lot more, but that's life. Um, in terms of accuracy, the, this graph here, the top left, is kind of the ideal case, so I in a sense. You want to have a model that has as few features as possible, but is as accurate as possible. So ideally, you want to be at, as close to here as possible. So if we show you this uh, classical algorithm in the purple line here, orthogonal matching pursuit, it's a algorithm that approximates an L0 regularization like we're implementing. The blue lines, the solid line is trained on a D-Wave 2, my, my model trained on a D-Wave 2. The dashed line is trained on one of the simulators, Isakov simulator. Um, and you can see that it does, it basically is roughly the same in terms of accuracy. Um, however, this is not always the case. This is for a couple of data sets. For one data set in particular, when you run it on the simulator, it still works perfectly. When you run it on the actual D-Wave, Sometimes you get results where it's worse than if you just randomly made guesses. So I think the something to do with embedding parameters, tuning them properly here, I didn't really investigate, so I don't know. Uh, as a classifier, there's also some accuracy, uh, same as the orthogonal matching pursuit here. So again, top left is the ideal case. If you notice these green and red lines, this is random forest and gradient boost, they're the nonlinear models. They're, they're always going to be really good they kind of have some correlation, they, they find correlations between features that are 
uh, that a linear model wouldn't find necessarily. However, they're not really doing feature selection. They're not really choosing the smallest number of features that you, a, as possible. So it's not really a, a, it's kind of a different comparison to make. Also, they, they tend to be even slower than the, uh, so this is in time, time taken, even slower to train than a, a D-Wave 2 approach. So um, in terms of scalability, yeah, we know that D-Wave 2 doesn't fit that huge problem. So 10 to 20 features is what we can get. Um, if you, you know, implement stuff in NumPy, then you've got a pretty linear scaling uh, pre-processing stage. Um, then the post-processing is, is your bottleneck. Um, and also this, this model does support uh, online learning, so you could deploy it onto a server and just keep feeding it data and it will just get better and better over time as well. Um, and finally, in terms of feature selection uh, performance, uh, one particular advantage that I, I think a lot of people have identified before is um, the D-Wave gives you a lot of very good solutions very quickly. And here you'll see an example, this is orthogonal matching pursuit, the algorithm where, the classical algorithm we're comparing against. It gives one solution, the features look roughly the same in, in, to the solutions we got with the D-Wave, but it only gives you one solution. It can only give you one solution, it's a greedy algorithm. So the D-Wave gives me three solutions, they're all roughly the same accuracy, but they're totally different. And sometimes you want totally different models because maybe you have certain constraints on which features you care about. Um, obviously, Random Forest gets a lot better accuracy, but again, it's picking these tiny little amounts of features that sometimes you don't care about. So in terms of takeaways, this L0 approach, um, it's, we've seen it before. Some of these uh, guys from, uh, um, from our hosts are going to have, I think, a talk next about the same sort of stuff. Um, this, there, there may be some interesting stuff to look at with these L0, um, but I think if you haven't seen some of these tools and, and techniques that I've described, that's probably the main takeaway. Um, if you want to, if you're interested in further research, there's always, you know, doing more rigorous analysis of the sort of stuff. Um, using D-Wave as a hybrid online model that's always online and you're always feeding it data, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and with that, if there's any questions, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan. Some quick questions. Hey, Dan. So it, it looked like you built a pretty complicated Sklern pipeline or whatever, but and but you said you didn't really play with the parameters for the D-Wave. Like, that was always one of the things when you actually get your hands on that I have trouble with doing stuff that's not just, like, dumb grid search over mm -hmm. annealing time and stuff like that. So... You, did you play with them a little bit? Did you? Because it can be pretty big effects. Yeah, I, I spent a little bit of time playing with it. I didn't have a lot of time for this project, so I couldn't really spend a lot of time for it. Um, I was trying to work out things like um, you have to do pre-processing on the data. So, for example, if you scale the data all to normal distributions, and then, like, does that affect the embedding parameter that you need to set? And the answer is yes, but how? I don't know, and I spent some time trying to figure that out, but yeah, nothing that I really did kind of helped, so right. yeah. Well, there's new parameters coming, so. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I have one comment. Um, there's a uh, study using a simulated annealing of the exactly the same problem, and the simulated annealing is known to be good for this problem, for finding the planted uh, correct solution. So maybe you can compare your method you. with yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, no, I haven't looked into that. I, I'm not sure about, so the simulator I used is Isakov simulator. I don't know if that's the spin vector on Scala one or if it's a different one. I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that. It's different. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I thought it, that was a simulator annealing one, but maybe it isn't. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.